Welcome to chapter four of Mineral Exploration and Mining Essentials. Uh, so this is the chapter on mineral exploration. Um, so the chapter will be divided into a few videos. Uh, the first one uh, that we're going to look at now is a little bit about the kind of business side of exploration. Um, we are going to uh, look at um, properties, sort of how you acquire a property um, and you know, staking properties and that kind of thing. Uh, then we're, we'll walk through a series of exploration techniques. So the kind of methods that we use um, in mineral exploration um, and spending a fair bit of time uh, looking at drilling, um, which for sure is the most important of all the exploration techniques. Um, you know, as I said earlier on, one of the videos is that uh, you know probably more than 80% of all exploration budgets are spent on drilling because it's the only technique that we have that can go down into the ground, uh, obtain a sample of rock uh, through drill core and bring that up to the surface so that we can study it and map it uh, and send samples to the lab uh, for analysis. So we definitely want to spend some time talking about drilling. But uh, let's just start off with um, exploration properties. So, you know, what are uh, exploration properties and the different types of properties that uh, people um, will explore on? Um, so I think the, the first thing to say is, uh, you know, what is a property? So a property is an area of ground in which a company or, or an individual has acquired the right to explore for the underlying minerals. So in most um, jurisdictions around the world, and, and of course there's a lot of variation, but in most jurisdictions, um, the mineral rights are, for one thing, separate from surface rights. So somebody who owns uh, surface rights, um, you know, the land, uh, ranch, or whatever it is, uh, often does not own the mineral rights. And the mineral rights are held by uh, usually a government. Um, a national government or, or a state or provincial government. And uh, those governments have set up systems in which companies and individuals, uh, by staking uh, a claim or a concession, uh, get the right to explore for the underlying minerals to you know, see whether they can discover a mineral deposit. Um, those uh, claims or concessions, um, for the most part, do not give you the right to mine. They only give you the right to explore. Uh, in order to mine, um, of course, you would need to go through a series of uh, assessments, uh, environmental assessment, permitting, etc. Uh, and most commonly, then a mineral claim is converted to something like a mining lease, uh, which is a different type of land ownership, which then gives you the right to actually uh, extract uh, rocks and minerals from the ground. So when we talk about a property, again, a property is an area of ground which a company has acquired the right to explore for the minerals underneath the surface. And um, we can talk about different types of properties. And, and he, so here's a few examples um, that are commonly used or terms that are commonly used. Uh, the first one, uh, a grassroots property. So a grassroots property, um, kind of as it sounds, is, is an early stage property. Uh, that's one where a company is primarily focusing on trying to make a, a new discovery. Usually I would say in these kind of properties, there, there isn't a mineral deposit that's being uh, discovered or identified. Um, it doesn't mean there isn't any mineralization known. I, I would say there probably is. There are areas of you know, copper or gold that have been found. Uh, maybe even there's been some drill holes and you know, a bit of a body of, uh, of rock with uh, elevated metals in it has been found, but really we haven't defined a mineral deposit. So the, the aim of work on that grassroots property is really around um, trying to discover new deposits or maybe uh, you know working on some initial discoveries and, and trying to uh, prove them up into something that's um, more, more significant and that we might call a mineral deposit. An advanced property then to me is one in which there, uh, a mineral deposit has already been discovered you know, probably through that grassroots uh, exploration. And the focus here is primarily to expand the size of that deposit that's been discovered. So you've got something, but you know, we don't know it yet, yet well enough to uh, really assess its economic potential. 
So a lot of the work here is going to be uh, drilling, step out drilling as they call it, you know, drilling out along strike or down dip uh, to try and expand the size of the deposit that's already been discovered. And of course, assess its grade through analyzing the uh, samples that uh, come from, uh, from drilling. Um, now, I should also say that on a grassroots property, depending how big it is, uh, there's almost always going to be some, uh, sorry, on an advanced property, uh, there's almost always going to be some grassroots exploration going on around it. Uh, again, the theme of where there's one deposit, there's likely more. Um, you know, if you've got a, a good deposit and you're really drilling that off, at the same time, you're probably going to spend a bit of money looking around to see if maybe there are some other um, deposits on that same property because who knows maybe the first one that's that found uh, really wasn't uh, the best one uh, and then the third one that I like to define here is what I'd call a pre-feasibility property um, this is one in which really the work that is going on in that property is primarily drilling it would be what I'd now call infill drilling uh, this is all those drill holes that need to be drilled in between um, ones that you've already drilled to increase the density of the drill hole spacing so that you can calculate a, um, a mineral resource estimate or you can upgrade uh, your mineral resource estimate um, in preparation for doing a, a pre-feasibility study. Um, you know, in order to be able to uh, do a, a good, accurate uh, resource estimate and then to use that resource estimate in a, a pre-feasibility study, you often need a lot, a lot of drilling. And so to me, a pre-feasibility property is really, that's the focus, drilling it off, increasing the density so that you really understand the deposit and you can move forward with the engineering and economic work uh, that is part of a, a pre-feasibility study. Um, I'll just mention these two terms here too, uh, greenfields and uh, brownfields. Uh, so a greenfield property is a property that is in an area that really does, doesn't have any known mineral deposits or, or past operating mines. So it's kind of a new area, you know, an area that uh, um, doesn't have that history of known deposits. Um, you know, the upside of a greenfield area is you could make a new discovery, you know, a brand new discovery in an area. Um, the downside is, is if there's no deposits known there, um, it's harder to find things, uh, there's less known, and um, your potential is, is arguably a little bit lower then a brownfield property. Uh, a brownfield property is one uh, that is in an area that has known deposits um, or often past operating mines, um, you know, that sort of thing. And so it is in an area of known mineral deposits. That's good. I know I probably said it too many times already, but where there's one deposit, there's more. So, you know, if you're in an area with known deposits, you're kind of, uh, as they would say, an elephant country. So that's where you want to be. Um, the downside is though, usually in brownfield property areas, there's already been lots of work. So making a brand new big deposit discovery, uh, it's possible um, and it certainly happens. It can be tricky though. Um, and you know, the, yes, you may discover some mineralization, but um, it's possible that, um, you know, any big deposits have already been found by the work that's been done before. So. Um, you know, there's a little bit of a toss up, both greenfield and brownfields are good properties to have. There's just a little bit of a different, um, you know, approach to it and, and a different reason for, for picking those uh, up. So, um, you know, stages of exploration, and this comes back to the different types of properties that I put down here. Um, lots of steps that people go through um, as they explore a mineral deposit and um, try and develop it towards a mine. And this uh, chart here gives you some of the different sort of activities that would happen and the different focus that you're putting into the property in those different stages. Um, as I put up here, so time, you know, is increasing this way, obviously, it's, you know, as you're moving along um, over a period of years, uh, time is increasing. Uh, expenditures are also increasing. Usually at the earliest stages in a grassroots, um, you know, it's not super expensive to uh, explore, um, but the chances of finding anything significant are probably not that high. So, you know, that's that's the, the toss up. And, um, 
your risk as you go this way also decreases. Again, on an early grassroots property with no known deposits, um, you know, it's a pretty high risk that you're gonna not find anything. Um, is that right? No, there's gonna be a high risk that you just, that there's just nothing there. Um, but again, your expenditures are lower. As you move this way uh, in the stages and you maybe get to a pre-feasibility property, uh, for sure you know that there's a deposit there, so your risk is less, but now your expenditures are quite a bit higher. So, um, you know, really as you move through, um, and I think I described this on the previous chart, you know, grassroots is about picking up a property, prospecting it and trying to find a, um, you know, some deposits or, or mineral showings, doing that initial uh, drilling on it and hopefully making a mineral deposit discovery. Then uh, it, it would progress to an advanced stage at that point. Um, you're doing more drilling to try and expand the uh, size of the deposit, stepping out laterally in that depth and probably doing that initial resource estimate to see if the grade and tonnage is approaching something that, that could be economic. Then as you get to pre-feasibility, maybe your initial resource estimate was looking positive. So now you're gonna be drilling a whole lot more holes, really define that deposit very, very clearly so that you can do that engineering and economic study that is the pre-feasibility study. Um, and then, you know, you'll often loop around here. Um, you'll do a pre-feasibility study. It'll look pretty good, but you maybe need to do more drilling to define the deposit uh, better or hopefully maybe expand it a bit more. Uh, and then you may go back and upgrade your feasibility study. If all of that looks really positive, then you could move towards mining. Um, you know, doing that final feasibility study in preparation for mining, and then, you know, moving through construction and operation of that mine. So this is kind of like an idealized sort of uh, set of steps that um, companies would go through as they're uh, exploring different types of properties. So one of the uh, um, aspects of this theme of where there's one deposit, there's more, is that it can generate what's called an area play. And an area play is where a region becomes a very hot uh, location for exploration, um, often as a result of a new mineral deposit uh, discovery. So if you're in an area that uh, maybe didn't have known deposits or maybe nobody's been exploring there much for a while, and then a new discovery is made, uh, it generates a lot of interest. And so uh, very quickly, you may get a whole lot of companies coming into that area, staking ground or picking up properties uh, and starting to do work in it. So the region becomes a real sort of hot area for exploration activity, um, sometimes for a period of, of years. Um, this map's a pretty good example. This is uh, for a region in the Yukon called the White Gold District. Um, this goes back quite a number of years now, but um, uh, a new discovery was made in this area and very quickly it generated a whole lot of staking. So you can see, um, you know, lots of, uh, lots of properties here. Uh, the different colors represent different companies. Uh, so there's many companies that have come in here and worked. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, this region is just a little bit south of Dawson City, Yukon, uh, which is the location of the Klondike, which is really uh, the largest uh, gold rush area, you know, certainly in Canada, probably just about anywhere in the world. Enormous amount of placer gold in this case was uh, mined out of the out of the Klondike area. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that, you know, more than 100 years after, um, you know, the Klondike gold rush, not even that far away, um, you know, some interesting new deposits um, have been discovered, um, you know, the white gold deposit. Also, what's interesting to me is that it was this white gold deposit was, that was the original one, um, you know, the original discovery, I guess, that was announced that, that brought all the people into this area. But it, it hasn't, in the end, been the most significant deposit that's found. Uh, there's a number, or a series of other deposits referred to as the coffee deposits, probably I'll say plural because it's a series of small ones, um, that have ended up being the, the more significant deposits in the area. And, you know, that's also common too. Sometimes the very first uh, discovery in a new district or, um, you know, like this is, is not necessarily the best one. 